Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Colin Omerhertig. I'm the Dean of the Harris School here at the University of Chicago. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you here on behalf of the whole university, and in particular on behalf of the Harris School and the college. So many of you remember the considerable excitement that was generated some months ago when we discovered that we were able to attract uh, David Axelrod here as founding director of the Institute of Politics uh, and how important this was going to be in the, in the life of the university moving forward. This is the second event in what I hope will be a very long series of such events uh, following the very interesting opening event we had on the day of the announcement. Now, I realize, difficult though it is for me personally to acknowledge this, that the main purpose of uh, this afternoon is not to listen to me talk, and therefore I would like to introduce to you uh, David Axelrod and hand over to him straight away. David? Thanks all of you. I just want to report on uh, uh, a few uh, advances that we've made, big steps forward in terms of making this institute uh, a reality. Um, and uh, one of them is, after an exhaustive search, um, we found a great executive director uh, here, uh, uh, Darren Reesberg. Darren, would you stand up? I honestly didn't know Darren before uh, we, we started looking, and Darren uh, uh, is perfect for this job for a number of reasons, uh, one of which is he's spent seven years doing splendid work at the State Board of Education as their general counsel and really as their chief operating officer, doing, negotiating with the legislature, interacting in so many different ways uh, with politics and public policy. Uh, in this state, but uh, as I said to a group of students I met earlier, one of the things that really attracted me uh, to Darren in this role uh, was the fact that he had, uh, he was a, a very successful young lawyer at a very prestigious law firm and decided to give that up in order to uh, do public service. And that, of course, is an ethic that we want to inculcate young people with. We want to encourage public service. And so he's not only a great organizer, not, a gr not only a great leader for this effort, but also a great example for, uh, for our students. So we're very pleased to have him. Um, we also uh, uh, met today uh, with uh, the architects and folks who are planning our space at 5707 South Woodlawn. It's going to be a great home for the Institute of Politics. A lot of thought and effort has gone into uh, renovating this entire building, and uh, I am so excited about that. I think it will serve our purposes, and a lot of great uh, stimulating programs will emanate from there, and hopefully it'll be a home uh, for all the students who, uh, from across the campus who are uh, going to participate um, in this program. Finally, I want to say I had a chance to meet with uh, about a dozen student leaders uh, today. And, you know, I've been very energized about this project from the beginning, uh, but it was really gratifying to, uh, to meet with the students who all had wonderful insights, observations, because ultimately uh, this is only going to be a success if they own uh, this institute. Uh, and um, uh, it was, uh, it was a, a meeting from which I emerged even more excited and more eager. I've got one more assignment here that I have to complete, but, uh, but I can't wait to get here full, uh, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in January and begin this program uh, in earnest. We're, we are going to have a series of events uh, between now and then, and many discussions to help plan that. So let me get to this event. Uh, we are really lucky to have uh, a, 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 a tremendous panel of people, all of whom I, I deeply respect and who have uh, great insights into uh, national politics. And uh, to host uh, this, we have uh, a man who is the trustee and the uh, host of the, the most venerable uh, and influential uh, Sunday morning talk show in American politics, Meet the Press. Uh, David Gregory bought, brought to that job uh, years of experience as NBC's White House correspondent. And I can personally attest to the fact that he puts uh, all his guests through the paces uh, one of the tests of candidates is whether they can pass the meet the press uh, test. And, uh, and so we're so grateful that he came here tonight to bring his thoughtful and incisive uh, moderation to this panel, uh, David Gregory.
Uh, four years ago, in the last campaign, uh, we knew that there were some smart people on the other side who we were contesting with uh, every day, but I didn't, know, uh, I didn't know them. I didn't know them well. And uh, after the election, I got to meet Steve Schmidt, uh, who was the senior advisor of the McCain campaign, um, since immortalized in the, in the book and movie Game Change. Um, but what I learned about Steve and what uh, I most appreciate is the passion that he brought uh, to politics. For him, it wasn't just a game. Uh, he cares deeply about this country. He's brought that experience and that passion to all the projects that he's uh, been involved in. He helped elect Arnold Schwarzenegger governor of California and uh, has a long pedigree in, and great insights into our political process. So let me introduce uh, Steve Schmidt. Anyone who uh, is a, an observer of national politics uh, and our, na our nation's uh, life uh, has probably run across um, some th of the thoughtful work that Eugene Robinson does on a regular basis in the Washington Post. He's a Pulitzer Prize uh, winning journalist um, who has uh, tremendous uh, insights into the process and also great passion for this country. and. Uh, and what it is and what it could be and should be. Well, let me introduce uh, Eugene Robinson. Now this next uh, panelist is uh, known as the man who made Steve Schmidt famous. Uh, John Heilman uh, is the uh, co-author of Game Change. Uh, he is a uh, he is a superb uh, political writer for New York Magazine. Uh, the fact is, um, because of game change, uh, he has uh, found a way that many journalists have, and I think Gene can attest to this, to actually monetize his work, which has made him the envy of journalists across America. Let me introduce John Heilman. Now, the reason that we were a little delayed is our hope was that this fourth chair, and it remains our hope, uh, will ultimately be filled uh, by uh, former Governor Jennifer Granholm of Michigan, who, um, uh, whose flight was delayed by weather and whose uh, trip here from the airport has been delayed by a typical afternoon on the Kennedy Expressway. And so um, she is forging her way here. We're hoping that she can participate in at least part of this panel. As you uh, probably know, she's uh, now uh, the host of her own program on, on uh, current television and uh, a frequent panelist on uh, uh, various Sunday morning uh, talk shows. Also someone who brings uh, the insights of a, a practitioner uh, to these discussions. So. Um, uh, Jennifer hopefully will sneak in, sit down there, and immediately get involved in the, in the, uh, in the panel. And um, there's a microphone set up there. Uh, once uh, the panel discussion is uh, fully engaged, David will then uh, solicit uh, your questions uh, for this group. So let's get on with the, the program. Well, thank you, David. Thank you all for being here. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure for all of us to be able to, to you know, talk politics and talk about the campaign with all of you and, uh, at an institute that I know is going to grow and flourish and, and, and bring the importance of Chicago to the national uh, political scene um, to follow up on all of that importance that has already been established, uh, particularly with this president. So what I'd like to do is a couple of things. We'll leave some time for questions. I want to talk about the state of the race and get into sort of the inside game. But I also want to save a little bit of time for what Axe and I were discussing is sort of the enduring questions about political process today, about campaigns generally, about a great deal of cynicism in the country, about how Washington works or does not work, the role of the media and all of that. And so I want to, I want to save some of that time in our discussion for that, because I suspect that might be an area of, of some of your questions as well. So let me start with where things now stand. Steve Schmidt, if you are running the Romney campaign and you've been in this position four years ago, you're looking at the most recent polling that shows a head-to-head -head race with the, the, both of them under 50%. Um, how do you chart this out? If Romney becomes the official nominee today as expected, 
Where, where is the process? Where do you think the, what do you think the strategy is? Well, I think it's going to be a very, very close election. It reminds me very much of the 04 campaign that I was involved in with President Bush, where you know, the race came down at the end to Florida and Ohio. And I suspect it will come down again to those states and you know, maybe adding on the uh, southwestern states where you have this huge structural problem for Republicans, which is the collapse of the Latino vote mm -hmm. that President Bush was you know, at 44% with, and you look at Mitt Romney's at 27%. So I think you'll see on the Republican side a lot of Spanish language advertising, a lot of time in New Mexico and Nevada and in, in Colorado. Um, Arizona is a state that, you know, Republicans I think will be okay in, but we'll have to, to keep an eye on. But it's going to be a very close race. Um, you know, Mitt Romney has to uh, be a candidate who has a solution to the country's economic challenges number one, and he has to be a bomb to the anxiety in the country. We are now deep into a, almost a decade of numbers where overwhelming majority of Americans think the country's on the wrong track, not the right track. You look at the Eurozone crisis, the turbulence that's going to be ahead, and you look at the anxiety that your average American family has. If Mitt Romney is able to make a case and he's able to do well in the debates on the question of who is the better steward of the economy for your family, then he'll be the next president. But it will be a very, very, very close race. John Hyman, pick up. You've just done a piece that's uh, online in New York Magazine. It'll be in the magazine this week about what the master re-election strategy is for this president. Um, <clears throat> I'll do that in one second. Um, I, wanna, I just want to ask one question of this group, because I never like to do these things without knowing who we're talking to. And, okay. And so, so let me just, I'm going to ask you guys, I'm going to take a poll, show of hands, okay? And, and if you're uncomfortable voting in front of your neighbors, just close your eyes. You'll feel a lot more <laughs> comfortable. Um, either in 2008, how many people in this room either voted for, or if you were too young in 2008, supported President Obama in the 2008 presidential election? Raise your hands. Okay. Um, how many people in this room voted for or supported Senator McCain? Okay, I see one. Okay, so by, so by the standards of Chicago, this is an ideologically diverse group. <laughs> Just wanted to get that nailed down. Um, <laughs> so the, I think the, everything that Steve said I think is right. The, 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 the core construct of this piece, which I'll just crib from since it's kind of on my mind, is that there's, you know, the, the election is in some ways a contest between economics and demographics. And the economics right now are very, are very much in Romney's favor. Um, the president has faced huge economic challenges, but he doesn't have a great answer to, are you better off now than you were four years ago? And so he explicitly is pivoting towards how, you have to not think about that. You have to think about how you're going to be in the future. And there's a set of arguments they want to make, the Obama campaign, about the contrast in visions and values on economics, which they think they can win, but not by a lot. I mean, the, the prevailing economic conditions in every way, if you think about GDP growth, uh, wage depression, unemployment numbers, obviously, that people point to, all of those things reflected in the wrong track, right track, feeling of the country, and this kind of pervasive sense of anxiety that people feel in the country, those are conditions that make it hard for an incumbent to get reelected. Not impossible, but those are headwinds that the president faces. On the demographic side, the president's people, I think correctly, point to a series of what are the Obama base, a series of segments of the electorate. Minority voters, most particularly Hispanic voters, women voters, most particularly single women voters, and young voters that were part of this new coalition he built in 2008, and where he has really huge leads over Romney, partly because of strengths that he has and partly because of, of things that Romney did in the course of the GOP nomination fight, positions he took on immigration related to Hispanics, on contraceptives related to women, uh, uh, th that, that make it very, that build in, what Steve talked about, the structural advantage in the Southwest, the president has big leads with big, growing, ascendant parts of the electorate that give him a lot of ways to get to 270 electoral votes and, and, and make it, Mitt Romney face a very thin line to get to 270. The president has four or five different scenarios where he can get that way. The Southwest path right. is most striking, I think, to a lot of people in politics. The notion, I'll just, I'll just, yeah. like, just, just like the notion that the president could win the Kerry states plus New Mexico, Colorado, Nevada, a bunch of states that he won in 2008, and 
He doesn't need to win Ohio. He doesn't need to win Florida. He doesn't need to win North Carolina in that scenario as long as he ends up holding on to Virginia. So he's just got a lot of paths to get there. Right, and I want to talk about a little bit more about the map in just a minute, but I want to stick to kind of the, kind of the master strategy at the moment. And Gene, pick up on something that Steve talked about, the 2004 strategy. You know, I cover that 04 race, and I see it every day. And it boils down to another point that John makes in the piece, which is uh, basically tearing down the opposition. I mean, if, if Romney's strength is he's got to be a plausible alternative to the president, that's where the Obama team is going to go to work and say, you can't trust this guy. Yeah, the Obama team, um, first of all, is going, wants to define Mitt Romney before he gets a chance to define himself mm -hmm. um, to the American people. He would like to define himself as uh, a successful businessman, essentially turnaround artist who will turn around the country. Uh, and uh, the Obama campaign would like to define him uh, as Scrooge McDuck basically, um, uh, with a dog on the roof of the car. And, um, uh, and that's kind of, you know, they're making some headway. But I do want to talk about the map, I, it, yeah. because if I were running the, uh, uh, the Romney campaign, which is a frightening thought, actually, uh, but if I were. You're top on their list. Uh, yeah, sure I, I, you know, I've been waiting for that phone call, and it somehow never comes. I think the election will be over at this point. Um, yeah, yeah, well. Um, but no, but I would be, I, I would be looking at that map. Check the real clear politics side. There, the states they have, solid Obama, leading Obama. You know, they're up to like 243. I think that's a, maybe a little high, but 243 is what they calculate to be his probable baseline, and 170 for for Romney, uh, and, and which means that by their reckoning, uh, which is kind of a compendium of, of, of the, all the state polls, by their reckoning, Romney almost has to run the table um, uh, on the, uh, the the truly contested swing states. That's a tall order, and that's kind of what I would be thinking about if I were in that position. Well, stick with Ohio then, Steve, because one of the issues there is that in the northeastern part of the state, the Romney, by their own admission, the Obama team is going to run a very strong uh, uh, message campaign in an area of strength for them based on the auto bailout in, in Michigan, which they think will play well there. They still think they've got suburban, primarily female voters that they could target. And the social conservative vote in the South might be more problematic for Romney. I've even heard the Romney campaign wonder aloud whether they've got a Mormon problem there in terms of uh, uh, that being an issue in the southern part of the state. So how do you break down Ohio and its importance then for the rest of the map? Well, I, I think it'll be a key state, you know, once again in the middle of the electorate. And I think there's a number of different combinations you can look at that John alluded to where you could lose Florida, you could lose Ohio, but you could win the southwestern states. and For Obama. You know, you for, for, for the president yeah. and, uh, you know, and put it together. I, I don't think that at the end of the day, realistically, that's that's going to happen. I don't think that the president can lose, you know, both Florida and Ohio and you know, go on to win the go on to win the election. Um, you know, look, we're going to have a, uh, a really big debate um, in the in the election, uh, particularly when we get into the fall debates about, you know, what is the definition of uh, the, the free enterprise system in this country. You know, Mitt Romney's gonna have to go out and make a case. He's gonna have to talk about the economy. He's gonna have to talk about how wealth is created, how prosperity is gonna be created. I do think that one of the structural problems that the Obama campaign has, that if you look at the collapse of trust in every institution in the country, um, you know, from big business to big labor, to big religion, to the political parties, the, go uh, the government, so on and so forth, everything with the exception of the military, even below the financial services sector is, is government. And I'm not sure that the voters who are in the middle of the electorate that will decide the outcome of the election believe that there is necessarily a government solution over a private sector solution to once again get us back on the path to prosperity. But you know, look, Mitt Romney's gonna have to make a forceful argument and he's gonna have to be able to connect with those economic voters and he has a number of impediments to it. Uh, you know, certainly you look at Southern Ohio, you know, does the Mormon issue become a, a voting issue in the electorate? It, it might. You look at the, the president's uh, you know, record with the auto industry, uh, I think it takes Michigan off the table and I think it makes Ohio you know, a little bit more difficult, but it'll be a race, uh, you know, that's going to be very, very close. You know, in, in 2004, you know, I think we won by 130,000 votes, which was the difference between a President Bush and a, 
and a, and a President Kerry. And I think it'll be that type of race, that type of closeness. Well, so let me ask this for, for anybody. What is the President doing to speak effectively to the disappointed supporter from 2008? I, I don't know, maybe somebody in this room is a disappointed 2008 supporter. You know, take a, take a family, take a couple where maybe, uh, maybe the wife supported Maybe they both support him, and now the husband's saying, no, that he's bad for us, I'm not doing, you know, you, I, you gotta go with Romney this time, and she's not quite there yet. What is the president doing to speak to that voter? Can I, can I, can I, I, wanna, I wanna answer this question, I'm gonna speak. You're not gonna I'm, ask another question of the no, audience, No, 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 I'm gonna, I'm, I, just, I wanna do the, I wanna, I wanna answer this question, I wanna answer this question as if I'm David Axelrod, and as if I'm Karl Rove. And okay. I'm, I don't have finger puppets, but if I did, I would use them. So, so, so here we go. He's Here's, so pleased he invited you. Carl, <laughs> this, is, this is Carl Rove, okay? Okay. The president's doing nothing to address those people's concerns. All the president's doing is running away from his record, David, because he has a terrible record, and he's got nothing to say. An incumbent president must run on his record. The president doesn't want to talk about his record. He might want to talk about killing Osama bin Laden and saving the auto industry, but that's all he wants to talk about. And other than that, it's all diversionary tactics. All he's going to do is tear Mitt Romney down. Okay. And here's David Axelrod. Carl, you ignorant slut. That's the, but, but, not, but not really. David would. Isn't that finger at least? David. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to do my Rahm Emanuel imitation, but I didn't want to get in trouble because I know this is on video. You know, I think David. What, what David's saying, and I'm, I'll be serious about this, is I think that that what the Obama campaign believes is that. Voters are, in fact, a lot more, there's no question that they sense how anxious people are. And that for the eight to 10% of voters in swing, actual swing voters in actual swing states, that there's, they're not totally sold on the president's record or his economic management. But they believe, they understood the depths of the problems that he inherited to a greater degree than the pundit class gives them credit for. That their polling shows that people when they asked them four, three years ago how long this was gonna to take to get out of the hole, these people were saying five years. And if you ask them now, they're still saying another two years. That they, don't ex they didn't expect there to be quick solutions. And that the president has to make a case that things are getting a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And that they're gonna get a little bit better and a little bit better slowly going towards tomorrow. But crucially, forgetting about all the, 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 quite, we're, we're the part that Carl is right about, is that what David and his, and his associates and the president have to do is say, to Steve's point, Mitt Romney doesn't have a plan. He doesn't have a theory. He doesn't have a way to explain how his private sector experience is one that leads to creating jobs. He didn't create jobs at Bain. He didn't create jobs as governor of Massachusetts. He doesn't have, other than invoking his private sector experience, he has no theory of the case. Right. And so all he has is right-wing dogma and an attachment to an industry that has led to boom and bust cycles in our economy for generations that we don't want to but, see repeated. But also, we don't want to step backwards yeah. to failed Good. policies. That's yeah. the argument. I think, I, think all, I think all that is basically right, um, uh, puppets notwithstanding, um, <laughs> uh, and you know, whichever finger you use. But I, I actually think that the Obama campaign has to do more than that. Um, when, when the president spoke out about gay marriage, there was a, there was a kind of a, a crackle, an electricity about that moment uh, that reminded me, first time I had been reminded of 2008 in a long time. Um, and it, it, the hopey changey stuff, as, uh, as Sarah Palin said. I, I think politicians have to be who they are. That's who he was in 2008. I think, I, I think the campaign has to, has to articulate and project. Um, some hope. But you have a record, Gene. You have a record. You have a, a team that came in yeah. saying, you know, we got to change Washington. Washington is broken. They came in, had huge swings at the plate, connected on health care, stimulus, yeah. financial reform, exactly. and a number of other things. But and then you have a results got, problem. But, well, you, but you've, got to talk, you've got to talk about that. And I think, right. for example, I think you can't shy away from talking about health care. You spent a year of your administration pushing health care. Um, uh, you know, Sisyphus like up the up right. the hill. Um, you put all that effort in, uh, and I think you've got to um, you've got to talk about it in a in a positive light, well, not as as oh uh, well, yeah, but that's behind us. But but I think you have to go beyond just talking. All about right, it. but Steve, of so of course you can't you can't completely run away from it. I, I but I do think you have to um, you have to touch that nerve 
um, or, tr or to the extent that you can, that he touched in 2008. So, but Even it, though it's a different what, what would you worry about if you were on the Romney team that the president might start to do successfully in terms of speaking to that disappointed vo voter? Well, I think you have to not, you have to acknowledge, I, look, I, I think one of the most powerful things you can do as a political candidate, and Arnold Schwarzenegger did this after a disastrous special election in, in California, and he had the re-election the next year, is he went out and he acknowledged that people had such high hopes when he won the recall, uh, that he had fallen short, he had let them down, he cleared the air and moved forward. And part of the message focus on our campaign is that today is a little bit better than yesterday, mm -hmm. and tomorrow is going to be a little bit better, you know, than today. It was incremental. It wasn't grandiose. It was believable. And our slogan in that campaign was, uh, the, in the in the dichotomy in the ads was forward versus backwards. And so one of the criticisms we had in the Bush campaign at this point of the campaign in 2004 is that there was a total absence of a second term agenda. And there was great demand in the pundit class, even amongst a, a number of Republicans. You know, you have to have the agenda, you have to lay it out. And I think when you run campaigns, you know, and especially having gone up against this team, but you know, anyone who's you know, done this at a national level understands the pacing of the game. Mm -hmm. And you know, controlling the clock is an underappreciated virtue in national politics in a presidential campaign. And you want to roll out your agenda for the second term you know, through the prism of the convention. You know, through the prism of the fall. You know, people have short attention spans, short memories. They want new content. They want that new content all the time. So, you know, it seems to me if you're the president's campaign, you're going to have to answer the question ultimately. I don't think necessarily in June or July or August, but certainly in September, October, forward to where? Well, is and it that brings forward up over the cliff yeah. in, the, in, the, in the Republican estimation, or is it you know, forward to some destination that is better than today. So my we'll have to answer that. The question that, uh, that Karl Rove would always, you know, say in 2004 is if, if the question is the war on terror, the answer is George W. Bush. Mm -hmm. Is there an equivalent in 2012? If the question is what, the answer is singularly President Obama. I don't feel like they've been able to answer that question. I don't think so either. And I'm not, not quite framed in that way. Um, I think, you know, well, they the, would frame it as, as if the question is the economy, it would be President Obama. That's the way they would frame it. I think they would frame it more broadly, though. I would think if they're, that they would say if the question is progress, right. the answer yeah. is Barack Obama. Right. If the question is regress, the answer is Mitt Romney. I'm still hung up on Eugene's image, though, the president, and hearing that, you in the gay marriage announcement, mm -hmm. hearing that crackling mm -hmm. sound. I think that was David Pluff sticking Joe Biden's finger into a light socket. Well, that's what that sound was. That was that, the crackle. That's okay. what that sound was that you heard. <laughs> Um, but I, I, I think that's, you know, I think that is really, I mean, there is a, there's, there's it's a layered thing, this notion of Romney is, there's nothing new in what Romney has to offer. And there's nothing, there's, there's both, in terms of economic theory and economic policies, the things that he's offering are things that brought us low in, in led specifically to the great recession that we've just been through. And if we go back to that, that's where we're going back to. But I think there's a broader kind of thing, and it comes up a little bit in this piece that I wrote, where it's, it's Romney is, and this ties into this demographic thing, Romney is retro. He's the 50s. He's backwards. He's your dad's Oldsmobile. He's not what modern America looks like. Right. And, and that is another way in which he symbolizes a step backwards rather than a step forwards. And again, for the constituencies that the Obama administration and the president's team here are trying to mobilize, you talked about 2004. This is much more of a base election. It's an election about how do we get our voters out? And to drive those, to keep those gaps that I was talking about before wide and motivate those voters, young voters, Hispanic voters, women voters, in key parts of the country, driving that, this, the vision of the country that Mitt Romney embodies is not a vision of the country that you are really part of, that you are a full participant in. Barack Obama's America is one that look, that is, that's inclusive of you. Mitt Romney's is some other vision that you never had a real full stake in. I think that's key. So how do, if, if Romney's at 48%, who does he take from the president from 2008, um, what voter does he take? Well, I, I think I think look, I think North Carolina is going to go back, uh, you know, to the to the Republican side. I think that you know Virginia is going to be a key battleground, but you know I would be bullish on Virginia from a from a Republican perspective. But look, I, I think that both candidates have a floor of about 47 
I think the president's floor is a little bit higher, and I think the president's got a ceiling uh, that's about 51 to 51 and, you know, 0.2, and, you know, Mitt Romney's got a ceiling that's about 50 and a half. It's a very, very closely divided country, and, you know, part of the issues that we're talking about is, you know, just a function of gravity. Um, in 2008, it was the worst Republican environment that anyone had to run a campaign in, you know, for, for John McCain. Uh, it was a campaign um, that uh, the president's campaign at the time outspent the McCain campaign and the Republican effort by a quarter billion dollars. And if you look at American politics as a continuum from 1968 forward during this era where trust has just collapsed um, in government and political parties, you know, there are only two people you know, over that arc of time you know, who had the ability to inspire hope um, and that people believed in and, and were big unifying figures. One is Ronald Reagan, the other is Barack Obama. And I think that just the reality that Ronald Reagan had running for re-election is that there was a momentum to a recovering economy. I think the structural problems in the economy are a lot worse, a lot more severe than they were in the early 1980s. And you know, that momentum of a recovering economy hasn't, hasn't caught on yet. So you have to deal with the disillusionment of expectations that were you know, astronomically high and, and, out of, and out of whack as he's, you know, come back to earth as a conventional politician, a president running, running for re-election. And I think they'll have to work that through, but I think by the time you get into the fall election, they'll have largely worked that through. I want, there's a couple of larger questions I want to get to, but I want to stick on a tactical thing here and, and ask you about the legacy of the Sarah Palin pick yeah. and how you think it will influence Mitt Romney this year? Yeah, a lot. I think Rob Portman's probably going to be the, uh, <laughs> the vice president. Look, it's, it's going to be... Who the plays plan. Rob Portman in you the know, movie? The <laughs> I, 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 are you, I think, um, Steve, are you, you referring know, to the only man in America no, who makes Mitt Romney look no, like Lady look, Gaga? I think... Um, <laughs> I, I doubt that we will be the last campaign that made a politically expedient pick, you know, for the, for the vice presidency. <laughs> but we're going to be the last for a while, mm. and um, which is which is a good which is a uh, which is a uh, which is a good thing. And I, look, I, I think you're going to have to you're going to have to pass a threshold test, which is, um, you know, Republicans, Democrats, and the news media are all going to look at the nominee and they're all going to have to agree that the person is unquestionably qualified to be President of the United States on, on day one. Joe Biden, for example, uh, passed that test. You look in the Republican Party, it's actually a very, very small number of people who passed that test and who also passed the pro-life litmus test, which will be applied. Does, does Marco Rubio pass that test? No. I, I don't think, I, I, Mar Marco Rubio, I think, doesn't, I don't, uh, no, I think he's too young. Does he fall into a game I, change I, I, decision? I, I think he's. I think he's. I, I think he doesn't get them enough. Uh, as a as a political matter, I think he doesn't solve the problem with Hispanics. He helps a little bit in Florida, but it's not clear that he wouldn't help just as much by campaigning a lot for for for, for a Romney in Florida. And he's just not ready. He's not 40 years old yet. And I think it does raise those questions. He also has various questions about his background that are in dispute. You don't want somebody who. His biography is in dispute. His financial background is in dispute. He has some areas, again, whether he's guilty or not, these are all stories, as Steve knows. What you don't want is a vice presidential nominee, especially in the wake in the post-Palin era, is you don't want someone who you can guarantee is going to drive a week or two weeks of stories about, well, where was he real? What was the real story with his parents? And right. what happened you with him? You don't want issues that have to be settled. What happened with him with the credit the cards? And, you know, it's, it's the reason why Bob McDonald, the governor of Virginia, someone who would have been a great choice until the transvaginal ultrasound question came up. Right. Nobody wants a week of stories about transvaginal right. ultrasounds. That's true. But As I, the Obama I, campaign would say, invasive. I can't believe you yeah. said that twice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, <laughs> that you're right about Marco. I'm driving, I'm driving Chicago's <laughs> message here. You're, you're right about Marco Rubio's pump probability. Uh, I would have said all those things. I recently um, spent an evening with him, uh, and I, I gotta say, he's a lot more impressive than I thought in, in, in terms of um, uh, his, his polish, um, really bright, really, um, so he, he, he would certainly be an interesting choice. And, you know, I, I, if I were the Romney campaign, I'd probably make that determination, and, and then if I sat down and had dinner with him, 
I'd at least rethink it before making that, that same determination that I didn't want that. Yeah, I, I just think the circumstances are so different. It's not going to be third and 19 for the Romney campaign on, you know, heading, heading into the convention, A. And then, you know, for Marco Rubio, I just think there's a much greater likelihood that he's going to be the keynote speaker at the convention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He is fundamentally a, fi uh, a figure uh, of the future for the Republican Party. He is, you know, for Republicans in a lot of way, I think that he's Barack Obama circa you know, 2000 and 2004. Um, and I, I, you know, I just think when you're 40 years old, you know, it's very young and, um, you know, probably after Palin, highly unlikely. It's interesting, you know, when we, uh, we could debate a lot of different issues. We could talk about the role of government and whatnot, and, I, and I'd like to touch on that. But still, this is fundamentally a choice between uh, two men, and people are going to make this kind of gut check decision. Maybe it's going to happen in the, uh, at the time of the presidential debates. Uh, or maybe you know some other you know crisis where they take their measure, but I think it's very interesting that um, you know if you go from your ad uh, of he's the biggest celebrity in the world, which was meant to sort of knock him down, to the point where now you have the Romney campaign deeply concerned about the fact that most Americans really like the president yeah. and are rooting for him at some level. There's there's the fringe, there's the haters but rooting for him at some level and that that is perhaps the biggest obstacle that Romney has to overcome, how much they like him. The, the president has in every, except for a couple, but virtually every personal attribute he leads Romney and every right. likability, shares your values, strong leader, really rare because of the president's foreign policy accomplishments, it's very rare to have a Democrat who has a wide lead on the strong leader metric. That's Republican territory normally. The only place, and again, it plays to Romney's advantage in certain circumstances, is the places who can best fix the economy. Right. And, and, who, and who has a better chance of getting something done in Washington, which may go to one of your broader points, David, about like deeper issues. But that, right. those are the two things where Romney has a lead right now. And it's why, if you ask folks in Chicago, if you ask David, you know, what's, what worried them most, what worries the most is every exogenous thing that can happen outside the White House's control. It's all downside risk. There's nothing good that's going to happen that's going to help the president. They got their October surprise in Osama bin Laden. The anything that can happen in the economy is bad. Anything that happened in Europe is bad. Anything that can happen in Iran is bad. Mm -hmm. Anything that can happen on energy prices pretty much you know, is bad. And all of those things, because things are so tenuous, it just could be enough for Romney, even though he's not that likable compared to the president, or mm -hmm. as strong compared to the president, or doesn't share your values, because he has that lead on the economy, if people are just tipped over in the slightly in the wrong direction on their optimism about whether things are headed in the right or wrong direction, it could just be enough to pull him across the finish line. But it leads me to this broader question, which is, Steve, you said, you know, we're gonna have a big debate. Are we really? Are, yeah. we, are we really having a big debate about uh, role of government, about why Washington doesn't work? Not yet, but we will in the fall because, you know, at the end of the day, before Super Bowl size audiences, we're going to see, you know, three 90 minute debates with the two men standing side by side on the stage. And we live in serious times and it won't be a frivolous debate. Um, I think there'll be a lot of silliness and frivolousness, you know, leading up to it. You know, today is a great example of it, you know, with Donald Trump all over the news. Um, and I think that, you know, you'll see, you know, a continued debasement of our, you know, political dialogue driving, you know, cynicism, making people hate and despise politics more, turning off, you know, another younger generation. I think that's the mark of a you know, of a modern campaign. But, you know, at the end of the day, there were big issues on the table. You know, I think the two men standing up there will, you know, talk about that stuff in a, you know, in a, in a serious way. And look, if you're a Republican, um, you know, and I think Mitt Romney has had a, uh, a good stretch here coming out of the primary. I think you go through the ebbs and flows of a campaign where you go through rough weeks and everybody calls you, you know, from morning to night telling you what an idiot you are, you're going to lose the election. They're usually the first to, you know, call you up and tell you what a great job you're doing when you, you get out of that, you know, when you, when you get out of that cycle. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, is the American people, as you pointed out, they like the president, they want to see the president succeed to the extent that, you know, Mitt Romney is surrounded by people, you know, who are out there in the, you know, loony sphere. Um, you know, that's bad news. Um, and you don't have a lot of points to give up in an election that's just going to be, you know, this structurally close. And, you know, that's worrisome to me as a, as a Republican. Until we get to the serious um, um, big ideas debate, 
that I, I, I agree we're going to have. I do understand that there is a, a Wolf Blitzer and Donald Trump interview out there from today. You can sell tickets to it. <laughs> Cannot be missed. So <laughs> when you get home, rush to your computers and, uh, and check out Wolf and, and Well, let, let's talk a little bit about, more about that, because this idea of, and I, I'm not saying that, you know, <sighs> You know, a couple in, in Ohio is necessarily you know, going to have a debate about the role of government, you know, uh, but nevertheless it matters because it matters ultimately then what politicians take on um, of, of the series of challenges we face. So this question of what government does well, what it shouldn't be involved in, and, and when politicians are going to have the courage to stand up in a meaningful way, in a way that's incentivized or rewarded to take on Medicare, uh, and Social Security, and to deal with some, you know, the, the tax question. I mean, everybody says the tax question is going to be solved by the election. Well, who says that's the case? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. people, uh, people are high on drugs. Yeah, exactly. It's not going to be but solved so, by so the election. What, and, yeah, well, go ahead, you know, and, 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 you know, the, the sequester cuts are going to be out there, right. um, uh, potentially ready, ready to happen. Um, yeah, I, I think we're going to we're going to have a partial debate. I don't know if we're really going to get to first principles um, uh, about role of government uh, because I think um, the tendency is going to be for uh, Democrats and Republicans to kind of retreat to the battle lines. Um, are we seriously going to discuss entitlements before the election? I I kind of doubt it. So um, it makes me wonder what it. What it takes to become president in 2012, how that's changing, and how this process from how much money is going to be spent in this campaign through outside groups, how much this is feeding cynicism. What is the, the state of, our, of the way we get our politicians elected today? I think what drives the cynicism isn't necessarily the campaigns, which have always historically been rough in this country, going back to the beginning of the republic but they always yielded to a governing cycle where people of different parties were able to sit in a room together and in the case of where the country is today, you could sit in a room with a calculator and if you were to look at it honestly, I mean the following things are gonna happen. Medicare will be cut. Social security will be cut and means tested. Uh, defense spending is gonna be cut and there's a lot of ways to cut in the Pentagon budget without compromising the national security of the country. And of course, um, very few Republicans will say this, but taxes are going to rise. Um, and until we can have an honest dialogue about the very serious fiscal condition you know, of the country and you produce then a political debate that's totally detached from reality, filled with all the posturing you saw with the debt ceiling debate, you'll continue to have you know, a, a very, very cynical electorate because they look around um, and they see from institution after institution manifested, for example, uh, with the Facebook IPO. Um, and you know, I think there's some currency in this for the, for the president, that there's one set of rules for some people and a different you know, set of rules for, you know, for everybody else. But uh, you know, systemically, uh, things that used to work and that people remember them working within living memory are no longer working across, across the board. And um, you will, you know, ultimately, um, there's gonna have to be serious people sitting in a room who are able to navigate some of these problems in I, order to remedy them. I, I think that the, to, the, the, to each of your points, I, I, I think Gene, I slightly take issue with what Gene said to get to your, to, to try to address both these things at once. I do think there's gonna be, I don't know how articulate this debate's going to be, but I think you're going to see a pretty big, clear choice. At the level of, of the template and the symbolism, it's like, you know, you've got a guy who is going to say over and over again that the role of government should be much smaller across the board, and the, his private sector background, private sector, private sector, private sector, you know, trust business, business-like solutions, you know, that, my biography, everything about me. The president, He's not attacking business in a broad scale way, but he is going to be attacking this man's business experience in a pretty acute way. And the truth is that Barack Obama believes in government as a mediating institution in American life in a way that Menominee does not. And I think those differences will come through over the course of, this, over the, course of the next few months, that, that these guys represent pretty fundamental differences in terms of who you should trust, who you should believe in. To Steve's point about cynicism, I think you know, the polarization in our politics 
drives so much of it, and this ties into the money thing, David, I think, because you know, especially on the right, where there's gonna be so much money in this election, I mean, it's just mind-boggling. David and I have talked about this at some length for this piece. You know, two and a half billion dollars getting spent in nine states over the course of the next six months. Many, much of it by people who are very extreme ideologically on one side or the other, more on the right than on the left, but, but, but very, like, I think most people look at, at the debate in Washington, not necessarily the debate between these two, because we haven't seen enough of it yet, but the debate in Washington, and they, you know, the country is not as polarized as our politics are in Washington. Our, the politics in Washington are much more polarized than the country is as a whole, and I think that is part of what the combination of the reality show stuff that Steve often talks about with the fact that people don't recognize the debate that they're having in their families and in their lives and their extended families and at their churches and at the local saloon. They don't recognize the character of the debate in Washington. They look at that and they say, who are these people having this ridiculous debate? That's not how we talk about these things. Right. And that, with all the money pumped into the system by a lot of nuts who are gonna be pushing absurd issues, especially against the president, that have nothing to do with how anybody lives, Republican or Democrat. But so what, what realistically- is impossible, though, yeah. is, uh, that's right, but what is not impossible is that when we get into September and October, we find that we're having this debate at the level of bumper stickers. Uh, and, and that, uh, you know, sort of, sort of unrealistic, condensed versions of, of two philosophies um, and, voters are being asked to choose between, you know, protect all entitlements um, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and go forward, uh, or cut taxes and, right. and deregulate in, in the sort of broadest, crudest um, general sense. Uh, and I'm not sure that in life. Well, one of the things, uh, John and I were talking before we came on, and it just occurred to me about how he and some other you know, top political journalists left Washington at some point because they felt like, well, I can get everything I need to do in Washington done. I can be in New York, but I can, be in, I can travel to Washington. But it, it got me thinking about the fact that there is, uh, it, it goes to the point that Washington seems less vital as a place because not only, as you say, the debate can sometimes be ridiculous, but um, legislating in and of itself is, is now totally frowned upon. And, and this is kind of a challenge for all of you as well as you take in news and information because you know, we're culpable in all of this in the news media. But then with social networking layered on top of this, we do have this absolutism that runs through uh, you know, people who consume what we do uh, that does make it more difficult for politicians to stand up and say, well, I know this is gonna be tough. You don't buy that? No, I totally buy it. And yeah. I think you, know, it's, it, you, know, you think about, it's a weird thing that's true. You know, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Barack Obama all got elected basically promising the same thing. They all basically said, right. I'm going to go to Washington, I'm going to ease the bitter partisanship that's, that's made our, our capital totally screwed up and can't get anything done. You, you never thought you would see a more polarizing president than Bill Clinton until you saw George W. Bush. And you never thought you'd see a more polarizing president than George W. Bush until Barack Obama came right. in. And you can lay fault wherever you want. I'm not laying it at the feet of any of those three. It's, it, it's not, the system is so deeply screwed up and it's the way we elect. It's, you know, Steve and I have talked a lot about nonpartisan primaries and how you, like the structural incentives towards why there aren't competitive elections in Congress anymore and why the only real action is on the far right and the far left in primaries. You, know, you talk, think about gerrymandering around the country. You think of the way the, way the media has now become totally partisan. It has rendered three good, well-intentioned men who all came to Washington with the same mandate, totally incapable of doing that thing. They did a lot of other things. They didn't, they didn't lessen the partisanship. They didn't, make, they didn't lessen the gridlock. But they didn't make the politics, the politics of Washington more in tune with the country. They didn't, none of them was, did. did. you not have, your point, did some campaigning not yield to governing? Different things have yielded to governing. Unfortunately, it's usually, usually crisis, right? So 9-11 yielded to a lot of governing. Uh, the financial collapse yielded to a lot of government. I mean, that's the irony here. What made this president so polarizing is what he accomplished. Yes. And so, has there not been governing? Is this not just a, a violent reaction to that governing? I think that there has not been governing in the sense of dealing with the long-term issues that right. are facing long -term the country, problems. that are staring at us in the face, and that we have to reconcile or we will you know, not recognize the country 
you know, from a, from a prosperity perspective, you know, 20, 20 years from now. I, I do think that Ronald Reagan talked about the fact that we don't have uh, political enemies in this country. We have political opponents. And maybe that was because he was part of a generation of men that fought in a real war, you know, um, that, against an existential enemy, um, where hundreds of thousands were killed, where millions were, you know, where millions were under arms, and they understood uh, that though they had fierce disagreements on a, on a range of issues, that they could never be each other's enemies. And you know, look today that culturally, when a Republican representative in a State of the Union address, you know, shouts, "You lied to the President of the United States." You know, uh, not too long ago, he probably would have resigned from Congress in the next 72 hours. You know, today he receives a million plus dollars in online donations in the in the next in the next hours, and increasingly, to the point of the the, the corruption or the, you know, the basically the legitimizing of the corrupting influence of money um, through the Citizens United decision. Uh, what you will have now in every major competitive congressional race, U.S. Senate race, uh, with very very few exceptions the candidates' voices will be the smallest voices in those races. The biggest voices will be the voices of the outside ideological groups on the left and on the right, and it's gonna have a terribly pernicious effect on American politics. And if you want a model to look at you know, the place where, wow, we don't wanna go there, uh, one can turn to California, um, where, you have a, um, you know, where, where you have a system of uh, with gerrymandering and, and, the, and the redistricting, where you have a entire political culture that exists uh, in a state where they're paralyzed of losing the next primary. So you have a bunch of left wing nuts and a bunch of right wing nuts, no governing middle in the, in the state, and then therefore you have a collapse of a lot of the governing institutions of the state. Um, and that is a direction we don't want to go in as a country, but you have to be very alarmed about because it seems like we're heading there. But I, I, I'd like to turn to some questions in just a moment, but I don't want to just to be up here hand wringing. I want to think about and be pro- weeping, oh, no. and weeping and wailing. Let's weeping and wailing. We want to move right to weeping and wailing. Something's got to break this cycle. Something is bound to do it. We're just in, a, in an historical cycle. Gene, what what breaks the cycle that gets us? I mean, Steve lays it out rather clearly, mm-hmm. which is at some point taxes are going to go up. There's going to be a lot of uh, budget cuts. Uh, Medicare is going to get cut. A lot of the middle class entitlements are going to get cut. Something's got to give. Pension reform is going to happen in the city of Chicago, in the state of Illinois, and in, in, in Wisconsin. And this, it's going to happen. Right. It's going to, it's going to happen. I'm, I'm, I'm actually um, I, I'm optimistic because I do believe in the business cycle. I, I, I think all the stuff is easier to do in a growing economy than, um, than in, in, at a time when uh, uh, in, in, we're in such parlous economic times uh, and the stakes seem so high. And I think um, that, um, you know, assuming uh, China doesn't collapse uh, and, you know, awful things don't happen around the, uh, around the world uh, in the economic sphere, uh, you know, the, the sort of slow economic growth will, will start to move up on a better slope. And, and then it becomes easier to talk about these things. Or maybe it's the opposite. You know, maybe it's crisis, to your point, David, about mm-hmm. legislating getting done in the wake of the financial crisis and that they're 9 11. Jennifer Granholm, everyone. She came, she came to spill the water and just for dessert, apparently. I, I, it's a grand entrance. Yes, Governor, welcome. <laughs> it's nice to see you. Maybe it's a sovereign debt crisis, is all I was going to say. Maybe that's, I mean, maybe that's the thing that forces yeah. you. Like, like, we've seen action when there have been big crises. Maybe the thing that forces on, like, the grand bargain on entitlement taxes, maybe what has to happen is for the world to finally say, interest rates are going up. And if you guys don't get your act together, the America is going to be punished, and that's going to that will actually force people like to, to take. Well, I don't. I, did, I was trying to be the cheery voice of optimism <laughs> like here on this panel. Better. I, I like it better. Okay. It'll grow. Well, we, we do want to move on to some questions, but since the governor just uh, joined us here, uh, welcome. So Thank nice you. to see you. I apologize. Sorry about to your you flight all. troubles. My flight weather pattern. No. Anyway. Not good. Here I am. You have seven minutes for a soliloquy. Quick. <laughs> well, no, why don't we bring you into the discussion, though? We've, we've, we've covered a lot of ground, but it, it'd be useful, I think, to, to end where we started, which is, you know, as we are about to launch, launch into the summer of hot campaigning, how do you assess the, the landscape right now for the, for the president you support? Well, um, first of all, <clears throat> 
it is clear that Mitt Romney won the nomination. I just want to report Texas primary. He got, he clinched, uh, he clinched <laughs> as I was driving in, apparently. But um, uh, I think that clearly it's going to be close. I'm sure you've all discussed that. But I think in the end, um, the president is going about the campaign in exactly the right way. He's taking, um, he's taken off the gloves. He's showing that there's a contrast, and he is coming out swinging. I know you said something differently. I, I thought. Um, no, I said exactly the same thing you just did said. Did you really? Yeah, oh, sure. okay. Maybe, maybe I misheard yeah. from very far away. Um, but, but I do think that that's exactly what he should be doing, and I do think it's not a referendum, but it is a choice, and he is establishing that there that um, Mitt Romney's experience at being capital is not the experience that is necessary to run a government that a company is not a country. He, does he run the risk, though, because we haven't touched this point. What the Romney campaign is starting to say is, you know what, let the president keep jabbing with his left on Bain Capital. You know, Romney is never going to win the private equity debate in America, but people don't really know what Bain Capital is. But in the process, the president is going to increasingly come off as anti-business at a time when the private sector has got to have a huge role in helping this economy recover. Yeah, but I think the president has got to be clear that this is about Mitt Romney's experience and that his experience, his, um, his effort has been to grow jobs in America. And all you have to do is look at stock market up again today over 100 points that uh, the, you know, the, the economy's created 4.2 million jobs since the president you know, came on, private sector jobs. Yes, the public sector jobs have been lost, but that's largely because of recalcitrance in the states um, through, and, and cutbacks in the states. So I think the president has got to make a clear distinction between Mitt Romney and the business community and business in general. This is what he was talking about today, small businesses, how he's had all of these tax cuts for small businesses. I think he can make a distinction saying that Mitt Romney and his experience just because he's a business guy and a turnaround guy, as he so self-describes, does not mean that that is directly applicable to running a country. It's not that it's, it's not that being a business person is bad. It's that kind of experience specifically that he's relying upon is not the experience necessary to grow an economy. So as we turn it over to your questions, I'll, I'll end this section of it by telling a story about where I think things were four years ago compared to now and the change in, um, the change in environment in, in Washington. So four years ago, the president's elected. There's a great sense of of historical you know, accomplishment in the country. And Washington is all of us. I mean, you know, it's the, it's the last days of the Bush presidency, and there's a lot of anticipation. Uh, even, even the president's, the, the, the president-elect's face was on the metro card. So there's just a lot of hype, you know, at that particular time. And so uh, President Bush invited me and my three young children to, uh, to the White House to see a movie, which was very nice. It was Despero, and afterward, the president, the first lady, came down to hand out cookies to the kids. And so my, my youngest son, who is uh, now six, so I guess he must have been uh, uh, almost four, uh, where, or, yeah, I don't know, I, I shouldn't do the math, but the point is that he was... Uh, <laughs> hey, David, does this son actually exist? <laughs> is this just yeah, yeah, yeah. a story you're yeah, making? No, 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 he was walking and talking and the whole thing. That wasn't an infant or anything. And uh, so he, he, he goes to meet President Bush and he comes back and he says, Daddy, Daddy, I just met the president. I put my hand out, he put his hand out, I shook his hand, I just met the president. I said, sweetheart, that's fantastic, that's just wonderful. We're walking away, we're like five feet away from President Bush. He says, was that Barack Obama? <laughs> so it was a great deal of hype in the air. And uh, it's, uh, things have changed, you know, four years later. A anyway, let's, uh, let's get to your questions. I think we have a microphone right here. The story is too good to check. <laughs> Man. Hi, my name is uh, Benjamin Field. I'm a second year at the university and the executive director of the University of Chicago Democrats. So I guess I'm probably not the most bipartisan figure in the audience. My question was, I'm getting a vibe of a sort of discontent with the sort of political polarization and the, as you said, bumper sticker campaign tactics and discourse that we've been seeing over the, over the course of this election, over the course of the past couple years. So my question for you is, what do you see, despite all the rhetoric, what do you see really getting accomplished in Washington following the 2012 election and, you know, 2012 and 2013. Who are you asking? 
Well, I, I everyone. Assume, everybody, yeah. I mean, I, look, I think this idea of solving the fiscal cliff in the, in the, uh, in the lame duck session is, is fantasy. I mean, because you've heard Romney already say it. If he's president-elect, he doesn't want the lame duck session of Congress to make some decisions. He wants to shape you know, tax policy, tax reform, <laughs> even some of the budget cutting. I think you get a shorter term uh, solution. And I don't know, I mean, I just think that, uh, you know, I'm a little bit colored by covering President Bush, who, you know, had a pretty good reelection run and then came into town thinking, all right, well, now I'm gonna do social security reform. And that didn't happen. So, uh, you know, in terms of some of these tougher things, I think that there's gonna have to be something that forces their hand to get to the place where it basically boils down to, you know, will, Republicans will raise taxes, I think, if it's part of broader tax reform and if they get um, some kind of Medicare cut in the end. That's one foray into it. You think this Congress will raise taxes? If no, I mean, I mean I, I'm doubtful and the, the lame yeah. duck will, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. Anybody else? I, I would jump in and say that I think that there is great hope post-election, assuming that, um, that um, Democrats occupy the majority in Congress. But if not, then you're going to see a, um, a similar kind of rigidity. And I think it's up to people to be able to say to those who are elected, if you sign pledges promising never to compromise, then you don't deserve to be in, in Washington. Because that kind of rigidity is exactly what is causing this right now. And if you want progress, you cannot have this. Let's just point out that there's rigidity on both sides, even in your fair party. Wait, wait, wait. Let me just say, yeah, uh, on, on the Democratic side, there was, there is a willingness to compromise, and the president showed that for several years, and it got a lot on the left very frustrated at how much he was willing to compromise, and you can't continue to move the, the post without expecting something on the other side. I, I will just point out, though, that, that your hypothesis does hypothesize something uh, that's a rather large leap, which is the notion that, you know, if, if Democrats are in the majority in Congress, which, you It's know, a big leap, right? I mean, but, the, the, well, it, it, in the current- majority in some ways. In, in, the, cur in the, current con the currently constituted Congress, if Republicans retain control of yeah. the House, it, there's not, no one has a working majority in the Senate. Yeah. It's, you know, there's, there's, not a, there's not a clear path forward, but I, but I do think that the, the, the place, I mean, I, I was kidding about a sovereign debt crisis, but, Look, I, you know, this, the long-term structural questions around entitlement reform, tax reform, are, the president obviously knows that they need to be solved. Yeah. And, and I, I think there's some chance that the pressure, if not a crisis, the pressure of the business community, the financial community, right. the financial markets, will cause there to be, over the course, not in the blame duck session, or shortly next year, but maybe in the first two years, in the 2013-2014 window, you could maybe get that big deal right. done, and, and that would be you a huge the, transformative the thing. Community, though, do you think the business community would trump um, Grover Norquist? I think in the end that Senate Republicans actually want to legislate, and, and I think on this, and I think that's really where the hope, if there's hope, it's hope in, in, in getting actual leadership from Senate Republicans who want to get something done on this right. and then dragging Senate House Republicans along. Let's get, to some, let's get to some additional questions. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, you bet. Uh, hello, my name is Sam Blobaum. I'm a second year at the college. And um, one of you said earlier that in a lot of ways this election is, uh, is uh, has a tension between demographics and uh, economics. And um, a couple months ago, uh, a number of Democrats were sort of pushing a, a narrative of the Republican war on women um, and, and sort of uh, painting them, especially at the state level, as curtailing women's right, right to choose and, and right to contraceptions. And I was just wondering if you could comment on, on the wisdom of such a strategy and painting uh, Mitt Romney as, as sort of the head of a party that's looking to uh, radically curtail women's rights. From the Democrats' point yeah. of view, I think it's, it worked out fairly well, actually. Uh, I mean, just, um, uh, and you know, basically through no fault of their own. I mean, there there were um, Republican state legislatures and governors around the country uh, that took it on themselves to launch these uh, initiatives that were perceived by many women um, as an attempt to, to to roll back 
rights that were hard won. And Democrats are not no longer afraid of social issues. No, I look. I um, you know, there's 330 million people in the country, and outside of you know my marriage, the only other person in the country I have any idea how they use birth controls, Rick Santorum. And I have, I have, I have, I have, I have That's no idea. That's almost a definition, almost a definition I have, of TMI. I have, I have, I have no idea why he wants to talk about it, why he wants to talk to me about it, why he wants anyone to, <laughs> to know about it. And it, you know, politically, it's a, you know, it's not good. And um, you know, we, you know, you look at, you know, you look at a, you know, the the the, the cultural heart of the the party, the Southern evangelical base of the party. And you look at you know places you know that are important for us to be competitive in. We talked about Ohio. We talked about states like New Hampshire, in the in the Northeast, where you know uh, in an under you know reported you know moment, you had more Republican votes, really as a function of the size of their majority, you know that were the you know on the side of you know protecting the gay marriage right there than you know there there were Democrat votes, um, or Democratic votes. Um, the um, you know, so you know these issues are, are, are not good. Um, you know, if the party wants to, you know, attract single women, um, you know, suburban women, and um, you know, it's politically is problematic. But is there a Republican war on women? No, uh, it's a bit over the top. You know, might be politically effective, but I think you'll see all that stuff kind of dissipate over the months ahead. Let, can I just can I jump in on that? Because I think uh, I appreciate your your reasonableness, Steve. But your your party really in the states. Not at the federal level so much, but in the states, they're really, it's not a figment of anybody's imagination that the Guttmacher Institute has done an analysis of how many of these anti-choice and anti, you know, and intrusive measures, anti-contraception measures that have been done, and it has been a record-breaking amount that have been introduced and passed in state legislatures across the country. I think that's because there was pent-up demand. There was a series of Republican governors that took over in 2010, and Republican leg state legislatures, and Right to Life saw this as an opportunity to get a lot of stuff in the pipeline that they had been waiting to do. But it ha it's not a figment of anybody's imagination. It has been pushed through the system, and, and I do think it is an issue. Say, say transvaginal ultrasound. I, I, I don't ever want to say it. I, I, say, I, say it. I said it twice. <laughs> I said it twice before. I said it twice before. Oh, well, say so it you've again. already you said it twice, actually. Thank Invasive, you very much. much. Invasive transvaginal. <laughs> Hello, my name is Jonathan Rodriguez. I'm a fourth year poli sci major. Um, my question is about uh, Washington consensus. Um, I just. It's a question, I swear. Um, uh, I kind of want to push back against Mr. Gregory's question posing entitlements, uh, Social Security, Medicare, um, tax reform. And I wish uh, Governor Gov uh, Granholm was here because everyone kind of nodded their head like, yeah, that's exactly what we need to do. We need to cut Social Security, we need to cut Medicare, and we need to do a tax reform that cuts all the, all the, all the deductions for the middle class. Um, so I, what I really wanted to ask is basically what is there a dissonance between the Washington consensus and what polls actually show about what Americans well, want? Well, what is that? But I mean, let me push back on you. Right. Yeah, people don't want to have entitlements taken away from them. Right. The reality is the programs are going bust. Are it's they? Is Social Security figment. really going bust? Yes. It, it, yes, and it requires, and Medicare is even worse. Is so it? here's the problem that just if your if your if your construct is your construct right Social Security is more solvable than Medicare it doesn't mean that it's on a path towards solvency and I don't think there's any dispute about that but my, what I'm suggesting to there you there is I'm, I'm sorry sir but yeah. there is I must I must push back but all the polls show Americans do not want you to cut Social Security of course Security. they don't Social but Security is that... solvent until 2033 and right. 75 no, no, no. percent until you're after missing that. the point of course polls show that. Of course polls show that. If your argument is that we should only do what people want, that's not political leadership. It's democracy. Yeah. <laughs> really? Well, it's part of democracy yeah, to listen to your Yeah, of course it's part of democracy. It's part of democracy. But the reality is that if it, that the claiming polls that people don't want, I don't, dis, I don't disagree with you. Right. It doesn't mean that that's what's necessary to solve the budget problems that we currently face. Right, I'm sorry you, you, if that was disrespectful. I'm really sorry. No, you're not disrespectful. I'm just telling you, I don't, I don't think that relying on public opinion polls is what's bolstering your argument that, that reform is not necessary. But we don't Go have ahead, to argue about policy. You do raise a good point, actually, though. And the point that you raise, um, if I might phrase it for you, is that um, 
Uh, yes, you protect out Social Security. And you could you could make a change in the formula now. You could make a change in the formula later. Um, but there's not a Social Security crisis right now. There's no reason to rush and have to do Social Security next week. But. Um, well, right. But there's a, you're about to say there's a Medicare crisis. Well, I was going to say yeah. that, that Medicare is, is, a different, um, uh, is a different thing. Uh, and, it, and it is much more critical. And, uh, it, but there's more than one way to attack Medicare. And that's kind of the point. I mean, you, can, you could address it, for example, um, as um, arguably the president, the president says, well, we started bending the curve on medical Right, but here's the reality. If you to, think you when you are plans. retirement age that Medicare is going to provide you the service it provides mm -hmm. your parents, if you think that's accurate based on polls telling you that people don't want their benefits cut, that's not, that's not based in facts. That's all I'm saying. Governor, go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to say that um, both are problems. Medicare is more urgent. But the um, health care reform has started to bend that cost curve. And the phases that are yet to come are really important for containing those costs. Medicare, unlike Medicaid in many states, is a fee-for-service program. And that is not a good way to manage care. And we have to m transition that. It doesn't mean that the, the benefits will be cut, but the way the, the system is managed ought to be changed to be able to save the dollars. On Social Security, there are ways to be able to address that long term that are not um, cutting benefits for those who need them. You can, you can raise the cap on Social Security you know, deductions so that you can make it more feasible for those at the higher end. It's a very weird and perverse system that your contributions are capped once you hit a certain amount. Why do we do that? I'm not sure. I'm sure it's a vestige of something from the old. But if you, there are things like that you could fix, and both systems could be fixed. But the idea that you have to do massive slashing of benefits, I think you can be smarter about it to make the savings happen and make the things make it um, sustainable. Well, I, I, you know, look, I, I just think you know part of the, you know part of the issue that we face is coming to terms with reality, and you see this playing out in a in a very real way in Europe right now. Uh, when you're out of money, you're out of money. Um, in this country, is more in debt than any country ever in the history of, war, of the world since the beginning of time. And so, um, you know, when you, when you look at, um, you know, taxes on the Republican side and you look at Grover Norquist, for example, the notion that, you know, the definition of being a conservative is that you're against raising revenue always for all time for any reason, no matter what, is crazy. Um, on the same side, on the Democratic Party side, the notion that we're going to bestow more entitlements and we're going to look at people and tell them that the entitlements that you have are never going to be touched, never going to be cut. And when you try that. to have an honest discussion about mm -hmm. it, the answer is the wheelchair, you know, the granny in the wheelchair going off the cliff with the malevolent, you know, Republican congressman, you know, behind it. I mean, I just think that, you know, whether it's this next year or it's four years from now or five years from now, we will come to a moment of debt crisis in this country, you know, where the following things are going to happen. Taxes will go up. Uh, there will be cuts, um, not hopefully to the people that need it the most. That will happen if there is a full-blown debt crisis. There will be cuts to Medicare. There will be means testing to it. There will be, you know, raising of the retirement age in, in Social Security and other reforms. And there's going to be cuts to the defense budget. Um, you know, where you look at the procurement program, for example, for the Joint Strike Fighter and the immense amount of waste, um, you know, that, that's built around that. You can cut defense and, you know, still maintain the preeminent military in the world. But there's tough choices, you know, that are, that are ahead that are going to have to be reality-based. And I just, one more point on this, we'll get to another question. I think your, your question, and I, and I don't mean to, I, I, we all appreciate you pushing back. But your question started with, with taking on the premise of some consensus about what it needed to be done as kind of a Washington problem. It is a, it's a fact-based problem. I mean, if you knew the percentage, and maybe you do, but maybe you don't, of two-thirds of the budget is gobbled up by entitlement spending, that's where the cuts have to happen. So if you think the debate starts by trying to win the fight over whether there's a Social Security crisis or not, that is sort of ignoring reality that is going to impact you and that is going to un impact government's ability to function. You wanted to say what? Um, I, I just don't think so. I, we can agree on Medicare. I agree on Medicare. But Social Security, Social Security is not part of the deficit. It's 
just not. Uh, so I, if we can agree, let's agree to not talk about sort of uh, I don't agree with that, and I don't think serious policymakers who are worried about the debt agree with that, especially when such easy fixes are available, like raising the retirement age, which, by the way, has bipartisan consensus. Republicans, Democrats would like to do that, but it still can't get done. Okay, everybody, you say that, that people, Democrats, you know, they're willing to make certain cuts. You can't enter into the conversation about Medicare among Democrats without rigidity about that issue. So it well, really is a bipartisan issue. You know, I think it's, we reached a great point here because, you know, Steve, you talked about before about the guy who shouted out, you lie. And we finally got to a place in the program where someone shouted out, you lie. But it was David Gregory instead of at Barack Obama. So that's <laughs> something, kind of, something, kind of excellent, something kind of excellent about that moment. <laughs> Go ahead. Round us off there. This is just America. Here we are. Yeah. Hi. My name is Asil Ahmad. I'm a Chicago-based entrepreneur. Um, I've got two questions. Both of them are brief. First is, do you think there will come a point in the next in this coming, in this election cycle or the next presidential cycle, where either legislators or the voters themselves will demand some sort of accountability to the amount of money that's pouring into elections in the form of um, essentially anonymous uh, corporate donations. And I think the last statistic I read is that, you know, by 2016, there'll be maybe three dozen people who are essentially funding a lot of the super PAC money that's buying ads. So my sense is that at some point this will get kind of ridiculous and either <laughs> Congress itself or, um, or, or the American public won't tolerate that level of interference in the electoral right. process. And the second question is a very tactical one given we have so many great strategists on the stage. Um, given how close this election will be, uh, is there a scenario where the Democratic Party um, convinces President Obama to uh, change his vice presidential nominee from uh, Joe Biden to Hillary Clinton, given her high approval ratings and his relatively not that high approval ratings. Uh, well, I can tell you, Joe Biden has said they already made up the uh, the lawn signs, they made, so I don't think they can change those at this point. <laughs> we can answer that. We can answer. Let's answer the second question first. No. no. Um, it ain't gonna happen. The first question. I I, the first question. I think it's, it's, again. I, I mentioned before. I talked about this with David somewhat, and I, it's it, the only the only right way to answer the first question about money is to say two things that are I think both totally true. The first is that. As long as I've been alive, the notion of money in politics and campaign finance reform and the pernicious effects of private money in our politics has been an issue that people have, have complained about and have whined about and have moaned about, and yet it's really never been a salient voting issue ever, anywhere. It's, it's gotten, we've had a, a, the incursion, going back to Buckley via Vallejo in 1976, which is the first equation of money with speech that the Supreme Court did. We've had an increasingly privatized campaign finance system. There's been more and more private money, less and less accountable money. People complain about it all the time, and no one in America votes on it. It is, falls into the category of things that are really important, but that most people see as <clears throat> process issues that are really far away from their lives, the filibuster rule in the Senate, incredibly important, incredibly important. Almost nothing would fix w the gridlock we've been talking about more than scrapping the 60 vote supermajority requirement that now screws up the entirety of how the Senate works. But no one in America cares about it. It's process. That's my first point. My second point is, and this is the thing that David and I have been talking about, is that we are really getting into like uncharted territory. If there's ever been a moment when it might now start to change, this might be that moment. It would be a really radical departure, though, from the way the public opinion and voting has worked on the issue of money and politics. But we are at a really radical departure point. And I, I think, you know, people are going to see this thing unfold over the next six months. That is going to be really, really grotesque and really disgusting and really weird. And it's possible, in, the, in light of that, that you might start to see people actually care about this issue enough to not just whine about it, but actually start to actually, if not vote on it, actually apply pressure in the places where it would need to be applied. But it's a very stiff test now, given where the Supreme Court is. You, it's, it's not an easily soluble problem, even if you had a majority that would vote on it. I am so encouraged by what John has just said, because I'm, <laughs> I'm the quixotic one. I really do believe that this election, where a billionaire can buy a candidate and buy an issue, is going to be a tipping point issue. And I strongly believe that this is a huge opportunity for um, President Obama in a second term. One of the first things to do is potentially to get a constitutional amendment 
passed, not through Congress, because he's not going to have the two-thirds votes necessary, but potentially with an organizational structure like organizing for Obama already in place across the nation to have state conventions, a constitutional convention for the first time in our nation's history to get a constitutional amendment. That would be an awesome second term agenda. You know, one, one of the things that's going to happen in, in this election, it's going to happen on the Republican side, and I don't like to make a lot of predictions, but, uh, but predict this will happen, is you're going to have a point in this race uh, where it's very, very close. And you're going to have one of these weirdo billionaires put an ad up, and it's going to come from my side. It's going to come from the Republican side. Uh, and they're going to hijack the race in a way that profoundly hurts Mitt Romney at a, at a critical juncture in the race. And, you know, the extent to which, in, uh, and I think you can talk about campaign finance, you know, reform all day long. It's a, it's a complicated subject. You know, essentially all of the campaign finance reforms have pulled money out of the political parties and away from the candidates themselves and have dispersed it to the outside groups. And if you want to see a, a, a reform, I think you want to put the money back into the candidate committees and back into the political parties, and you want to have instant disclosure uh, you know, around, the, around the money, you know, not, necessarily, not necessarily limits. But like, like I said earlier, in any given congressional race that's a competitive race that will determine the, the outcome of Congress, the candidate's actual campaign committee, when it runs ads, will be the smallest voice in the race. It's very, very unhealthy. Very, very unhealthy for democracy. All right, we're gonna, I think we're going to make that the last word. Or no, Gene, finish off, and then Mr. Axelrod is going to close it up. You know, the more Donald Trump we see and the Donald Trump pack uh, over the next few months, the better it is in the long term for campaign finance reform. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>